Good afternoon, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, lecture of our lecture series 4040. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Benedetta. Uh, Benedetta Franzelli is a researcher at the French uh, National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, uh, at the M2EM2C laboratory at Central Supelec. Uh, so she, her interests are in theoretical, experimental, and numerical characterization of uh, multi-phase turbine reacting flows. And in uh, the laboratory EM2C, she leads the investigation of soot and nanoparticles production in turbulent flames using high-speed optical diagnostics and larger dissimulation. Uh, and this is all in the framework of uh, uh, air project, uh, air ERC starting ground project, uh, SOTUF. Um, she graduated at Politecnico di Milano uh, in 2007. She received her PhD from the Institut National Polytechnique de Toulouse, Serfax, in 2011. And uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, she worked at uh, the EM2C laboratory and then at the Center of Turbulence Research at Stanford. Uh, she has received uh, the Stanford Center of Turbulence Research postdoctoral fellowship, the Bernard Lewis Fellowship from the Combustion Institute, and as well the bronze medal uh, from the CNRS. Uh, I, I think this is all very exciting. And uh, recently, as I mentioned before, she was awarded this uh, scholarship from the ERC uh, for uh, her project. I, I suppose that she will update us on the, result, on the results of uh, her research. In particular, the title of her presentation is Characterization and Modeling of Nanoparticles Production in Flames. Benedetta, thank you again for having accepted the invitation and uh, I leave you the floor for the presentation. Thank you again. Thank you so much uh, for the exaggerated nice presentation and thank you to everyone to be connected and to give me the opportunity to um, present you the last results that we are obtaining the team at time to see laboratory about the characterization and modeling of nanoparticle production in flames. So first of all, I want to acknowledge um, all the co-workers uh, that are uh, that uh, participate to to this project, as you can imagine, this is the result of a teamwork that we have at the M2C since 2014. So since my recruitment, we are working in nanoparticle production in flames. I have the the chance to work with many uh, experienced, excellent researchers in turbulent combustions, but also in particle radiation and numerical tools. And I also uh, had the opportunity to have many PhD students and postdoctoral fellows that APA has a lot and perform most of the work, to be honest. And I also had the great uh, opportunity to work with many um, experienced researchers, uh, both from France, but also international. And mainly, as uh, uh, Alessandro said, uh, most of the funding comes from Europe and French. Uh, as well. And we also have part of this activity we were supported by Air Liquid, that is one of the historical partners of the laboratory. So now uh, we can start a little bit with the science. So as I said, this presentation will be, will be about nanoparticle production in flames. So when we speak about this with the combustion community, most probably we will directly think about soot. So soot is indeed um, uh, the a nanoparticle that is a, is a nanoparticle flaminis that are produced in the flames. They are organic solid particles of carbon materials uh, that are the results of an incomplete combustion of uh, fuels that contains carbon molecules. And they, we have to control them, their emission due to their negative effect on air quality, health and climate change. And it is true that today we're really uh, focus on energy transition and we'll speak about a lot about decarbonization of energy, but soot is still and will still be a societal industrial priority. First of all, because today, as you know, 85% of world energy consumption rely on combustion. And then scenarios for the future years are expecting to uh, uh, rely on energy mix, where we're going to work with blends of hydrogen or ammonia, together with carbon species fuel, like biofuels, sub synthetic fuels for renewables and CO2. And as soon as we will have some carbon into these fuels, then we will end up with soot. On the other side, 
nanoparticle production in flames is also a hot topic for other communities that are not combustion, such as material communities. In this case, uh, they are looking at and they will think about inorganic nanoparticles that are synthesized using the flames. And such nanoparticles, such as metal oxides, uh, like, for example, titanium oxides, are extremely interest for many industrial application. Uh, specifically, for example, TO2 is really using daily use products, and you have some examples here, but also uh, for new nanomaterial technology. I will provide you some details uh, after. And in both cases, even if your interest is in soot or metal oxides, what you want to do is to be able to control the production of these nanoparticles and their properties. And to do so, uh, I, I will show you how we need to understand deeply all the physical phenomena that are involved in turbulent combustion. And the strategy that we have is the, at the laboratory is to perform uh, combined experimental characterization with modeling and numerical simulations. So the goal of today is really, of this presentation is to uh, provide a characterization of the effect of turbulence on nanoparticle production in flames. We will start by looking at soot in flames. Uh, and we will, I will show you how we can, for example, use high speed measurements and high fidelity simulations to characterize the specific nature of soot production in turbulent flames. And how this nature, then this feature, will bring us new challenges for LES, so for larger dissimulations. And then we're going to look at metal oxide nanoparticle synthesis, metal oxide synthesis in flames. Now we can use the knowledge that we have from combustion, and more specifically from suiting turbulent flames, to improve our understanding and the design of aerosol processes and aerosol technology. So let's start with soot. Um, first of all, to start understanding what soot production is, it's a good idea to start by the easiest case, that is the laminar flames. So what we know from literature is that the soot production in laminar flames is the result of multiple simultaneous collision and chemical processes. And this process will depend on the specific local properties of the gas, the flow, and the solid phase. And all soot production at the end will be characterized by very long time scales compared to, for example, the full oxidation chemical schemes of the flame. Since all these different processes will occur at the same time, the result is a population of solid particles that have different size and morphologies. We can have, for example, small spherical particles or aggregates of a fractal dimension that are the results of an ensemble of primary particle of, of diameter DPP, and the final aggregate size will be DP. So if we want to understand a little bit more about the soot production, we can try and can look to an easy case, for example, the one, well, well, not so easy, but the easiest case we can think about that is the laminar premix flame. And we can look, for example, the total soot volume fraction that we have as function of the eighth above the burner. So first of all, close to the injection, we'll start having inception. That is classically represented as the collision of one pH species with another pH. pH, pH are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, a large uh, uh, gas species. Once they collide, you start having the first nuclei, so the smallest particle that you will have. And the effect of inception is that your soot volume fraction will increase because you start having particles. And the diameter of the primary particles is, is constant and is equal to the nuclei volume on diameter. We are not only interested in the solid volume fraction, so our global information, but we want to be a more specific on the characterization of the population. And for this, we may want to look at the particle size distribution. Mainly, we want to look, for example, in an in a easier way, we can imagine to uh, know what we want to know is how many particles we do, we, we, we have as function of the, of the size of these particles. So close to the injection, when we have inception, you will see here that we have mainly particle for two nanometer, so small particles, and we have a one peak shape distribution because we have mainly only one type of, of process. When you go a little bit downstream here in the flame, then the two major process will be condensation and surface growth. Both process will increase drastically the soot volume fraction production. On the one side, you have condensation, 
This is the results of a collision between the pHs, the gaseous pHs with one particle, and you obtain a bigger soot particle. And on the other side, you have surface growth. That is a uh, chemical process where the surface of your soot particle will react with the presence of acetylene, and you will have a, an additional mass on the particle, and in the end, you will end up with a bigger soot particle. So these two processes are the main process that bring and produce the most of the mass of soot, uh, of soot. So your soot volume fraction will increase and your diameter of the particle will also increase. So when you look at then at the, at the well, I would say a, a representative particle size distribution, you will see like one peak shape. So more or less a monotonic distribution with the presence of small particles and bigger particles due to condensation as soon as growth. Then you go even downstream. In that case, you will have coagulation that start to be the predominant phenomena. And coagulation is a collisional process that is the result of the collision of two particles to get at the end a bigger uh, aggregate composed of many primary particles. In this case, the soot volume fraction is constant, but the primary particle diameter is also constant, but the final diameter, the final volume of your aggregate will increase. So when you look at the particle side distribution at that eight above the banner, what you get at the end is a two peak shape. The first peak here is due to the presence of nucleation that is still active. And then you're going to have more and more bigger particles due to coagulation. So you have one peak shape, two peak shape particles, very different size at the same position and chemical and, and collisional process. Another process that I didn't mention here is the surface oxidation. It is not something that is relevant for premixed flame, but it can, of course, for diffusion flame. And in this case, this is uh, mainly the opposite of surface growth. It's a chemical process where you have the mass of the soot that is uh, oxidized by the presence of OH and O2. So soot volume fraction is decreasing and you got smaller soot particles at the end. Well, the point here is that you have many different processes uh, of many different nature and that arrives and occur at the same time. So it can be quite difficult to understand them, characterize them experimentally and numerically. Still, if you look at state-of-the-art numerical prediction for this flame, and you test very different models with different levels of accuracy here, so the experiments, once again, are the symbols. You have three different models. Um, what you get is that, well, still, the description of the suit volume fraction tendency as function of the A level of the barn is pretty correct, and that the, the, the models are also able to describe the evolution of the PSD from one shape to two shape uh, peak, depending two peak shape uh, with the A above the barn. So the models are providing more or less a similar um, description and your numerical simulation are within the experimental error bars. If you then take these results or other models that have the same kind of uh, agreement for laminar flames, you applied it to perform turbulent, the simulation of turbulent uh, production, uh, of soot production in turbulent flames, you will got very different results. So for example, here, I propose you the, the, um, a comparison of some results that were uh, obtained in 2014. Now we are a little bit better in terms of accuracy, but still the discrepancies are, are, are of the same order. This is a, a really reference configuration for soot in turbulent flame. Is a really turbulent diffusion flame that is studied at uh, DLR by the team of Klaus Peter Gegel. Here you have the soot volume fraction results, time averaged, obtained by LEI, and you have a mean value of 30 ppb for the soot volume fraction. And here you have two different simulations from two different teams. Those models were pretty well behave, have a, a good behavior on laminar flames, but completely different results than for turbulent flames with one order of magnitude compared to the experiments and even more when you compare of, of discrepancies when just you compare the models. So in a kind of general um, conclusion, it is true even 10, day, uh, 10 years after that the performances that we got in laminar flames are not predicted when we try to simulate the soot production in turbulent flames. And from my point of view, this means that there is something this is really missing. There is an essential uh, feature when we go to study soot production in turbulent flames that cannot be uh, accounted just by looking at laminar flames and developing model to, to consider laminar flames. 
and to understand uh, or to have an idea what it would be, well, I, I, I play a little bit safe, so I do experiments because I know that this is the true and the reality. So I, I got the, the information from the reality and then I try to understand what's going on. So to do so, we uh, perform light scattering measurements on 10 kilohertz. It was the first time that we applied, that, that, that high speed measurements were applied to the study of sooting flames. We have a jet flames here with an injection of methane with a Reynolds number of 20,000. And then what we go, what, what we did, uh, light scattering measurements are pretty easy. You just need a laser. Here we have a laser with a wavelength of 284 nanometer. Then you create with some lens a laser sheet and you use this laser sheet to pass through the flame. And the, the, the light from the laser will interact with your particle, mainly gonna be diffused, it's gonna be scattered. And you take an image with your camera of this uh, light that is scattered. And this provides you an information of the position of the particles of the suit um, how they are distrib distributed spatially uh, in the flame. So this is a classical example of what you have. And where is, is, is white is where we have the signal. It means that there, there was some particles. So of course, we have an information of the um, localization of them. We identify the region where we have suit, where we don't have suit. And since we are working at 10 kilohertz, we can follow this uh, spatial distribution in time. So what we can understand now, if you use sootless scattering measurements about turbulence and soot, for example, we take a look at what is going on here in the middle of the flame where you really have a, a intense yellow luminosity, meaning that you're gonna to have a lot of soot. And this is the kind of results that you have. So what is red here is the presence, the zone where you got a signal, meaning where soot are uh, located. And what you can see is that with time, the, the, the suit presence strongly varies in space and in time. And if you just take one image, the one that I showed you before, you will really see the presence of, you can recognize the presence of suit ligaments that are wrinkled by the turbulent eddies. So when I said about, when I said suit ligaments, I mean that the particles has the shape of a ligament, it's still particles, but the population is, is now concentrated in a smaller region where you have high concentration than uh, other region where you don't have the concentration of particles. And what you can really recognize here is that these uh, zones are governed, their distribution is really governed by the presence of turbulent eddies. And the fact that it's really fluctuating in space and time and that it's distributed along ligaments that are wrinkled by the turbulent eddies is what makes the difference. The key point here, the main difference between soot in flame, laminar flames and in turbulent flames, and it's called soot intermittency. And I will show you then how we can characterize this intermittency in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of more quantitative way. And here for me, this, this is really the main difference, what we have to focus if we want to understand soot production in turbulent flames. And to do so, we're gonna to use on one side high speed simultaneous measurements. The idea is to get an information on the evolution of soot in the flame together with other uh, quantities to see if there is any relation and also high fidelity simulations that can let us uh, understand a little bit more and uh, about this, this relation between the quantities and uh, uh, complementary information compared to experiments. So first of all, as I said, we can start by using simultaneous measurements to understand a little bit more. So we start with the same flame. This time we're gonna to have three measurements at the same time. We have information on uh, the fuel oxidation. So we want to have an information on where the reaction zone is localized. And to do so, we use laser in induced fluorescence of OH. To do so, once again, it's not so complicated. You need a laser, the good wavelength, and then you need a camera and you got the fluorescence coming from OH. And also at the same times, we synchronize a second camera that allows us to have information this time once again from fluorescence, but from pHs that, as we said, allows us to have an idea of the soot precursor presence. Then, once again, light scattering with a third camera that allows us to have an information of the soot presence. So when you combine this information, what we can understand? First of all, we can take a look at the information close to the injection when you start having a little bit of soot, what is called the formation and early evolutions of soot. 
Here you will have the results from OH in red and the one from soot in brown. And when you look at the video and their evolution, what you can observe, especially if you look at the results inside the flame, is that you have spotty soot region that are chaotically distributed in space and times. Whereas even if you are in a turbulent flame, your OH field is following an almost continuous distribution. And to understand why you have this kind of chaotic distribution, well, you can take a look at combine information from pHs in blue and soot. And here, what you will obtain is that if you look at the blue uh, contributions, so the pHs, you will see that it occupies most of the uh, core of the flame, but still its value, its intensity is changing with time. And this is in space. And this is because the pHs concentration is extremely sensi sensitive to the local stretch that is governed by turbulence. So um, since the pHs concentration is affected by the turbulent field and is varying in the time, then the inception, the nucleation of soot will be sporadic, meaning that you're going to observe a rare event. So this is one way turbulence is affecting soot production at the beginning, the formation and evolution of soot, what is called a local small scale kinetic process. The small scales of the turbulent flow will affect pH's concentration, and that's what's going to change then the way soot is going to accept and form and evolve at the early stage. But then you can look also at the results downstream in this region where you have um, a huge production and presence of soot. And this time, if you look at the results of, UA, of your OH and soot, so the reaction zone and soot presence, once again, this time you can recognize here, you've just got a nice ligament that is really wrinkled and deformed by the turbulent field. In this case, what you observe is the presence then of the effect of turbulence per boron dynamic than point of view. So you have a, a process that is more governed by the large scale dynamic of the turbulence. And small scale kinetics and large scale dynamic processes are um, in competition during the world production of soot and are mainly governed by turbulence. So these are really two main aspects that is not uh, found in laminar flames, of course, since they are governed by turbulence. So this is for an example of what you can do when you use high, measure, as high speed measurements to understand soot production. But as I said to you, you can also use high speed simulation, uh, high fidelity uh, simulations. So in this case, we perform a large eddy simulation of a sooting turbulent non-premix flames. This time it was an ethylene flame that was studied experimentally. What is uh, interesting in this work is that we didn't have only information on the soot volume fraction or the density concentration, number uh, concentration of the particles, number density. But we also use a, detail, a pretty detailed model for this solid phase description for soot. So we use a sectional method. What is nice is that we have information of different classes of soot as function of their size. So we have the evolution of the number of, of the concentration of the particle depending on, on their size. And as you can see here, you have information for the class of one nanometer, five nanometer, and 40 nanometer, for example. And you can already see that there is a clear stratification. And um, what is nice in this work is that this was the first time we were able not only to have information then on the particle size distribution, but also on the dynamic then of the particle size distribution that are, of course, governed and affected by turbulence. So first of all, we, we take a look at the results, time average for the particle size distribution in such a jet flame. And close to the injector, you will get the time average as a one peak shape. And downstream, as you may want expect it, you will get the two peak shape. And this kind of results shows a similar trend compared to experiments that were obtained for different flames, but also to what we have seen on laminar flames. So we may say, okay, this is not changing a lot. Because as I said to you, compared to experiments, uh, what was nice here is that we were able to assess information on the fluctuation and the evolution of the particle size distribution with time. So to do so, what, what we can do, and we can, for one specific position, we can, for example, plot all the different particle size distribution that we observe with time. Yeah, you have the, the, the and then color them by the probability to, to got them. And close to the injection here, what you see is that all time, okay, it's a little bit fluctuating, but still we have one peak shape. Downstream, what we got 
is a quite fluctuating particle size distribution, but all the time you will have two peaks shapes. And then there is a region, here indicated by the cross region, where you can have at the same time, not at the same time, but for the same location, depending with time, sometimes you got one peak shape, sometimes you got two peak shape. And then you can ask yourself why, since in laminar frames, you can get this kind of result. So you may know already the answer. So yes, it's highly fluctuating due to the turbulence and also why we got these two, two, two shape PSD. So to answer to this question, what we can do is that we can follow um, the particle two Lagrangian trajectory of the particles that were generated from the same position from the jet exit center. And we look at how the particle size distribution is varying with time following the two, tra the two trajectory. At the beginning, the results are pretty similar, but starting from a certain point, you will see that the particle size distribution are really changing a lot. And this is because, well, it's going to arrive, but basically this is due to the fact that the particles are going to follow different trajectories. So they're going to meet different local conditions. So they will experience different particle histories. At the end, you will have final particle state, particle size distribution state. <coughs> Sorry. So what you have to retain here is that what is very difficult here when you look at production in turbulent flame is that as history dependent phenomena. So your final result depend on all the different process, all the different local conditions that the particles have experienced along their trajectory. And that trajectory is governed by the turbulence and the local conditions that the particle will find along their trajectory is decided by turbulence. So once again, this is kind of challenging. So what we have understand with high speed measurements and LES at this point is that suit production in turbulent frame is intermittent that this concept means that is a local and rare event that occurs for very specific gaseous conditions that is affected by large scale and small scale turbulence effects, and that is an history dependent problem. So the question now is, can we use the classical LES strategy that we use for poorly gaseous flames to correctly predict such an intermittent soot field? So to answer to this question, first of all, we have to define what is a classical strategy for LES. So if you look at literature, what is mainly done is, well, classically, we use the same guidelines for gaseous flames. So first of all, you have to define a reference model combustion. In our case, we consider the ideal air burner that is a turbulent, as I said before, a turbulent wheel at diffusion flames. You have an injection of ethylene in the middle, that is separated by an injection of air through swiller. The, the flame then stabilized in the combustion chamber and then streams, you have the formation of soot. Then you have to choose what is your state of the art models by choosing what is probably the most ratio between the quality and the cost of your calculation. And then you let the transient solution to evacuate and then you start doing some TEM averaging the classically do is converge in considering five convecting times, meaning 60 milliseconds in our case. And then you validate, first of all, the gas phase field with the experiments. So in this case, we can take a look at the time average temperature that the air is obtained with calculations. And we have run the simulation a little bit more longer, up to 110 milliseconds, actually 200 milliseconds. And then we take time averaging, we do the time averaging over four different periods, 40, 60, 80, and 110 milliseconds. And then we compare along the center line, the temperature results from our simulation here in line, together with the results from the experiments provided by the blue uh, symbols here. And what you obtain is that except for the 40 milliseconds case, all the lines are converging and collapsing. That means that we have a time convergence of our results for the gas phase field when we consider a time averaging over that is longer than 60 milliseconds. We also have a good agreement with experiments so that our gas phase can be considered as valid. And then, well, you want to do the same with the soot phase. So for example, you may want to look at the soot volume fraction field and consider it by looking at different time average period. You take 80 milliseconds, two different period of 100 milliseconds, and then 200 milliseconds. And what you got here 
is that the soot loads evolves with the, with the time average period. So temperature was nice, whereas the soot volume fraction is always changing depending on how long you take uh, your time averaging period. That means that you don't go, do, numerically, you don't have a temporal convergence of your results. And what is, uh, uh, is to be noticed here is that when you consider in this case 200 milliseconds, is already a time averaging period that is longer of what is classically done in literature for this case, that is 60 milliseconds generally. That means that all the literature conclusion that we have on this configuration, for example, on model performances, well, it's probably questionable since results were not converged. But before being sure that this is how it is, we want to be sure that this is not due to a numerical artifact of our simulations. So to be sure that this is not due to a wrong or not nice simulation, well, what we can do, once again, we go back to experiments. In this case, we were kind of lucky because at DLR, they, they had already performed light scattering measurements at 10 kilohertz. And when you look at their results and you look at the instantaneous light scattering fields here, you will see that once again, the soot presence in this configuration is extremely intermittent. So what you can do now, well, you can do exactly what you do in, in your numerical simulation. So you consider time average of these results, but not on the whole uh, period that they were measured, that is two seconds, on the same period that we can afford in LES, so 100 milliseconds. If you take the first subsequence, you will get these results. These are the time averaging line scattering experimental results for the first subsequence. And then you take another one and you got this one. So, the light scattering fields, meaning the experiments, are not time converged when we consider only 100 milliseconds for, to do our averaging. And this is due to the soot flame turbulence interaction that I previously described for the jet flames, but also the presence of a processing vortex core that is affecting the formation of soot in the primary zone. And you also have in this configuration secondary jets downstream that will still affect with their dynamics the production of soot in the primary zone. So what we can understand and say is that, well, is the, not, the intrinsic nature of soot production in this configuration that doesn't allow us to say that it, we have a convergence in time at 100 milliseconds. But we have a problem now because with LES, we don't want to afford seconds or minutes of simulation, physical simulation. So the LES strategy that we classically use for gaseous flames, maybe is not reliable when you have a, such an intermittent soot field. What, what we can do? Well, we can reconsider the LES guidelines, for example. You can also, and we have developed some new paradigms to perform some model comparison, if, if, even if your results are not time converged. But at the end, what you want to do is compare your numerical results with the experiments. So the, the, the possibility or one chance will be maybe to develop a new statistical approach, new way to look at your validation model or approach. And I will try to give you an idea of what we can uh, develop in this sense. So once again, the idea here, how can validate my numerical simulation uh, that are not time converged with experiments. So you have plenty of instantaneous results experimentally. And what is the classical uh, way to proceed? I took them, the whole experimental data over two seconds. I do a time averaging and I got these results. But I can also do a different way. I can only consider part of this over a time averaging TFV that is equal to what I will do at the same length, what I can afford in LES. And then I have a second one and a third one. But at the end, I will end up with N subset of time average signals that I collected over the same periodic time averaging period that I can afford numerically. Now, how can I treat this data? Once again, I can use the classical approach. For example, I can take a look at what's going on along the center line. And this is my result for the reference case, so the classical approach. Or I can do the statistical approach. Then I can take my first subset and I represent how it's evolving in, in, along the center line, the second one. And then I plot all my N subset and I color them by the probability to get them. And what you can see then in this result, in this picture, is 
the, the totality of all the possible experimental time averaging states that I have observed, that are what can be uh, real in your configuration. What you can observe is that there is a high variability, meaning that once again, that, um, depending on the time averaging, my results can be really different experimentally, but this can also be considered and used as an envelope of all the possible experimental states. So kind of confidence chart to compare my experiment, my numerical data. So now I have my different way, to, a different way to treat the experiment results and my LES. So what I can do here, once again, classical approach. I took the totality of my experiments. I do the time averaging. I took the totality of my LES. I do a time averaging. I compare them along the center line. In green, you have the experiments. And in blue, you have your LES. And what you see is that there are significant discrepancies. And in that case, your conclusion would be, okay, my LES is not sufficiently accurate. There is a problem in my, in my models. Everything is wrong. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Or using a different kind of approach because you remind that your average time period was different. In that case, you will consider all the different possible states and you compare your LES with the experimental confidence chart that you have evaluated. And in this case, what you obtain? Well, that at the end, your LES results are enclosed in the experimental confidence interval. That means that they represent a possible experimental state. So the LES is valid. But at the same time, then you, you also can observe that your LES is not in the most probable region. So, okay, it's possible, but it's not so likely. So maybe the currency of your LES has in any case to be discussed with the caution. So to conclude this part on the, on the, on the suit modeling, I, I really, uh, the, the objective here was really to, to let you, uh, to convince you that is intermittency, the key here, and the main difference between laminar and turbulent flames, there is a sophisticated concept of, uh, that, uh, for suit because it's local, rare, history dependent, dependent on small scale and large scale dependent process. And according to me, its characterization and modeling are really the missing elements to obtain predictive LES. Now we can go towards nanoparticle frame synthesis and see how we can use our knowledge from soot and combustion to uh, work on also on this topic. What you have to know is that, as I already said, this is not so studied at this stage by combustion community, but there is a lot of work that has been done from the materials community. And I, I believe that there are a lot of things that we can uh, um, provide with our understanding of the phenomenon. So first of all, why we are interested on titanium dioxide in this case, but in more general metal oxides. Um, well, titanium dioxide represents today a market of 50 billion euro, um, dollars uh, every year. So it's a huge market. And generally we are interested in nanoparticles because they have a unique ratio, uh, surface volume atomic ratio. And that means that all the surface related properties are enhanced compared to the bulk materials can be physical, chemical, biological. As I already said, TO2 is everywhere, every day in your daily use product, plastic, paper, paintings, coatings, uh, candies, m &Ms, everywhere, your sunscreen, really everywhere. But it's also super interesting because it's one of the key to assess breakthrough technologies. They are super photocatalysts. They are also used as catalysts uh, for biomedical application. The, the, is, is huge, the, 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 the application range. It is also used for gas sensors. Here, for example, you have an uh, a case where they have produced a sensor using three different uh, TO2 um, nanopowders that were produced in three different ways. And they tested the response of the sensor as function of the concentration of CO. If you look at the results for the commercial TO2 here in, in, gray, in green, you will see that the response is inferior to the other two cases where the TO2 was ob obtained using flames. So what is the key here is that the, the flames allows us to uh, pr produce particles that have unique characteristics and are the, part the, cart the particle characteristics that decide the performance of the nanomaterials at the end. So it will be super interesting to use flames because we can access uh, unprecedented performance. 
So now I convince you that you have to do nanoparticles with the flames, but how you can do now in practice, it's pretty simple. Um, you have to know that um, basically you can, you can buy on the market liquid precursors, so liquid mixtures that contains um, atoms of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and of, for example, in this case, titanium. So you just take these liquid mixtures, you put into a flame through an atomizer, really classical with a spray atomizer. You got a spray, then you need a pilot flame to help the vaporization and to sustain the combustion of the central flame, of the pilot flame. And then once your liquid mixture is evaporated, you got a gaseous precursor and this gaseous precursor will at the end provide you the formation of TO2 nanoparticles. So what they did classically in literature, so the materials community, they got your nanoparticles. What they are interested in is not exactly, is really not the flame, but the final products, of course. So they look at the results at the end and sometimes they got pure TO2. Sometimes they got pure TO2 with carb or and carbon coating TO2. And sometimes they got soot and carbon coating TO2. And this depends on the operating conditions that they were, they were using. And the question here is, why we got so many different heterogeneous population of particles that will have different properties than different performances by changing the operating conditions. So what I do to answer to this question, uh, I will do what I do in uh, since the birth of my daughter. So in the last four years, as soon as I have a question to start with why, the answer, if you want to be listened, has to speak about princess, otherwise it doesn't care. So let's see what Princess can explain us about spray flame synthesis. So instead of having fuel and oxidizer, let's imagine that we have a monster with a princess and the reaction will be, of course, the love. And then at the end of the story, you women end up with a nice story of a princess and a prince or a monster plus a monstrous. And if you look just at the beginning of the story and the end of the story, you don't understand what's going on. So what we can understand on this and from these fair tales is that it's the journey that makes what they are. And this is exactly what happened and that we can translate that in a more scientific way as an history dependent process. And the question is now, okay, so flame spray synthesis is a history dependent process, but what does decide it? Well, if you remind a little bit the story about soot turbulent flames, you already know the answer is the coupling between the turbulence. In this case, we also have the spray, the flame and the nanoparticles. And these, the different production, uh, the different timescales that decide the end of the result, the competition of them. For nanoparticles, in general, aerosol process, we have three main uh, production uh, timescale. The production one, that is the nucleation, exactly as for soot. The coagulation one, that is exactly as for soot. And then the sintering uh, timescale, that is a um, uh, process that uh, is mainly uh, descri describe the reorganization of your primary particle to obtain at the end a spherical particle and it of course at really high temperatures. So how has that comes from combustion and turbulence can then make the difference for the nanoparticle flame synthesis? Well, since the results of the particles properties are the results of the competition between the different time scales, we can imagine to be able to tune the particle characteristics if we control the turbulence, the spray, and the flame. And now we can do this. Well, we first of all have to understand what happened inside the flame when we are doing the synthesization of the particles, the synthesis of the particles. And for this, we want to extend in situ measurements and LES approaches that, that we know for suit to spray flame synthesis. So as, as I said, we are more or less starting from scratch on this part. So we have to start with from something simple. We started from laminar flames. And we also uh, decided not to have to work with spray and vaporization to be really simple. So we develop a um, burner that allows the stabilization of a flame where we have an injection of fuel and gaseous pre-vaporized precursor. And then inside, so it's a classical laminar Kofu flame and outside, you will have a nerco fuel. And we studied two different fuel to sustain the pilot flame, hydrogen and methane. This is the case where you don't have TTIP, so we don't use any, uh, that is the, the liquid mixture that is our precursor for TO2. 
And when we introduce it at the end, you want to have immediately the formation of TO2 that can be recognized because we have really luminous central uh, um, region where the particles are formed. Now, what we want to do is be a little bit more quantitative. So we extended the laser inducing candidates technique that is really classical for suit to TO2. The idea is quite simple. It's not so easy, but it's quite simple. Basically, you use the laser to eat up the particles. When they are really a very high temperature, they start to be incandescent. And with the camera, you take the information of these incandescents, and we know that it's proportional to the volume fraction. Then we move the, the burner so that at the end, along the center line, we have an information of the volume fraction as function of the air above the burner. And you can see it recognize one first region where the suit volume fraction, oh, the TO2 volume fraction is increasing, and second region when there is no anymore the volume fraction increase, so it's a constant. And what is done with LER technique is that the temporal decay of your signal contains an information on the of on the particle primary and um, the primary particle diameter. So the smallest the particle, the quickest and the shortest will be your signal. So with this information, we can also have information on the diameter of the primary particle. And we can recognize the first zone where it's constant and the second zone when it decreases. And if you combine these two information, volume fraction and primary particle, you can recognize the diameter. You will recognize the main process. So volume fraction increase, primary particle diameter constant nucleation. Volume fraction is constant. Diameter of the primary particle is increasing is sintering. So we now know in this flame where are the main process, and we know then what are the ingredients to simulate this. So we also had to develop a wall description for a wall numerical framework. Um, and we started then to have a model for the conversion of TTP up to TEOH4, that is our precursor, gaseous precursor for TO2. Then we coupled with a model, there's a three equation model that accounts for nucleation, sintering, and coagulation. We have experimental results for the volume fraction, but we also have information obtained with the NSMPS, so the distribution of the aggregate size the, uh, diameter at, then, at 23 centimeter. So we have these two information and we look what our results tell in numerical simulations. So first of all, with our model, the original one that we have developed, we have a two quick nucleations. If you want to correct this, this behavior, you know that you have to in, uh, increase the characteristic production time scale. And then concerning the diameter of the aggregates, while it's too small compared to experiments, and we know that this means that the primary particle diameter is too big. So to uh, correct this trend, well, we have to uh, increase the characteristic sintering time. So we modify the models, and in that case, by changing this constant, and in that case, we are able to get a good agreement here in blue with the experiment for both the diameter and the volume fraction. We then have developed a simplified model because we want to do LES with this, and we validate this by looking before at, at, the, at the beginning with laminar flames. So here you have the image, the, the photo, and you compare with the numerical suit volume fraction. First of all, you can see along the center line that your volume fraction starts at two centimeter, and that you have an homogeneous distribution. Whereas when you consider metan flame, the production start after at above eight above the barn and five, and you have a maximum that is distributed along the, the wings. And if you compare with the experimental results from LE, well, in this region, we have from experiments an homogeneous distribution as in numerical results. And from our experiments, we also identify the maximum at wings where we are in the metan flame. And so it's kind of good agreement between experimental and numerical results, knowing that we're really starting from scratch. So we are quite happy. We can use it to perform really first tests on, on turbulence. So to do so, we just increase the numerical, in our numerical simulation, the velocity of a factor of five, and we want to look what's going on. So first of all, what happened here? Well, here you have an instantaneous results for your TTIP concentration, TOH4 concentration, and volume fraction. And what you can recognize is clearly a stratification of the process. TTIP becomes TOH4, that becomes volume fraction. So this is quite easy to understand. More easy than what going, is going on on turbulence, on, on suit. And then we can also compare 
with some trends that we observe experimentally on CO2 flames was not exactly the same uh, via light scattering uh, on the coupling and the effect of turbulence. So we still have a strong CO2 turbulence interaction. We can recognize both in experiments and in numerical simulations the presence of ligaments that are deformed by turbulent flow eddies and that are convecting that streams. And we can also recognize a high egg above the burner that we have an homogeneous distribution due to the diffusion effects, whereas for soot, we had a more um, intermittent fields. And more uh, as a general conclusion, we know that TO2 production is quick compared to soot. And that means that we have a reduced intermittency compared to what uh, soot, uh, what we observe in soot. Then if you want to do a very naive uh, co um, comparison between turbulence and laminar case, you take both. Of course, they are not at all the same, but still we can start doing some kind of analysis. You have the volume fraction here, laminar case and turbulent, and the particle primary particle diameter laminar and turbulent. So, okay, of course, the distribution are really different, but if you look at the levels and the yield are really not so different. So, okay, it's not so affecting these kind of results, the turbulence. But if you look at the diameter of the aggregates, in this case, you've got really different results. This is even more clear if you look at the results along the center line. In red, you have the results of the um, aggregate diameter from the laminar case. And in turbulent, you have the one uh, in blue, the one from the turbulent flame. What you observe is that you obtain bigger aggregates in laminar flames. And this is because the residence time in laminar flames is longer because you have a velocity that are smaller. And that means that we have time for the particles to collide and having bigger and bigger aggregates. So at start, we can at least say that we have very different morphology depending on the flow conditions. So to conclude, uh, once again, soot intermittency is what is difficult when you look at soot production in turbulent flames, both in terms of characterization and modeling. Whereas for nanoparticle formations, we have seen that the presence of nanoparticles is less intermittent than soot. So from that numerical and experimental point of view, will less, be less challenging. But when you look at nanoscale particle, nanoparticles, what you want is to be able to characterize the nanoparticles characteristics in terms of morphology, size, phase crystallinity, and these terms are governed still by the large scale turbulent dynamics and will be once again extremely challenging. So with this, I will hand up the, the presentation. As a perspective, what I really think will be a huge um, step will be to bridge then really this competence, having a common framework for suit and nanoparticles, a bridge then the competence from the combustion uh, community with the one from the process so that we will together uh, learn a, a lot on, on these topics. And from my perspective, this is a really super challenging, but really super exciting subject with really significant societal and industrial implications. And well, I'm available for all questions now or by email. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that Salvatore will, will start the q and a session now yes. yes yes thank you benedetta for very the very nice talk okay yes yes we can start the q and a session i yeah give the virtual microphone to everyone who wants to to ask a question to to benedetta raise your hands or just show the turn on your video if you have any any question for for, for benedetta Or yeah. I can start, huh? <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we have a okay. Do 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 you want to be a, a nice person and give Temisugle? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Temisugle <laughs> first. Thanks. Hi, Beta. Thanks for the for the talk. So, as you may know, since you were uh, last summer one of the speaker at the SPP in 1980, we are working on this nano particle modeling to the spray scene uh, uh, burner. Yes. And we actually were 
working on this uh, idea that you mentioned here also the last slide to use the knowledge that we gain from uh, suit also for the modeling of uh, nano, the nanoparticle. So, you know, we are using uh, with uh, in Professor Pitch Group, the HMOM uh, uh, method and so on. But we still have major uh, challenging in modeling the in the model of the sintering and um, and also for uh, uh, the uh, mm, coagulation of, uh, of part. So, given your experience in uh, uh, in the experiment that you run, mm. do you have do you see a um, a line that should be followed in the in the modeling of this uh, particular sub phenomena that we have inside the uh, nanoparticle uh, growth uh, modeling? So what I found particularly difficult when I started trying to do the the modeling is that we got most of the time only ends. Uh, information at the end of the of the flame, right? So um, you have many different processes that can need at the end of the same results for some specific quantities, but not the only one. For example, I'm not sure for, for the moment for the moment for the moment the model that I have derived. I'm not sure that is correct, just because I have only one point to fit all the models at the end. And is definitely super important, but more and more often we are seeing now working on on this uh, on this topic to get information all along the flame, and in situ measurements, in situ and ex situ measurements, because at the same time you want to know how many particles you have, the 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 size that they have. You have to have then SMPS model, but also temp, because the information is not the same. Because you so uh, I. At this stage, we are more on the empirical uh, um, way you can fit the models. And um, it's super important to get uh, more and more uh, information on exactly what's going on at the first stage. But if you already have the information from the SMPS, we'll get kind of aggregate information and time that provides you information on, on the morphology of the particles uh, because sintering is basically is going to be is spherical or aggregates. So if you've got different cliche along the flame, then you will be able to, to tune this. And it was not so, sintering is one of the, of the process was not uh, so many uh, um, studied in, uh, in um, suiting flames. So it's definitely something for which we are missing the models. And Sintering models that exist in literature were performed mostly by looking at furnaces. The waiting conditions are not exactly what what are the ones that we found in, in flames. So we have to be super careful when we use them. But I agree with you. This is definitely one of the of the problem. That's why we we try to go back to laminar flames to start looking a little bit on on this. Thank you so much. So if, it, if someone wants to work on this, uh, it's more than welcome because from the numerical point of view, we really need this kind of information. Yeah, we are, well, as you know, you, you met the student that is working on that and we are also willing to continue that. Now we are working for get a uh, new project on that. Mm -hmm. So probably in the next future, we can keep in touch and- Yeah, yeah, that's that. definitely. I know that there is a lot of work that is done mainly in Germany and Swiss on this topic and a little bit in USA, but I know that in Germany, they are really the leading, the leader of this topic in different, uh, I know that there are big project on this, but if you want to to look at who is doing the, 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 the super work on this, you, you have to look at different uh, German laboratories. There are many different teams that are doing an, a huge work on this, I know. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alessandro. Yeah, please. thank you very much. Uh, I, at a certain point you have mentioned, I mean, of course, all your presentation is uh, uh, is rooted in this interaction between uh, experiments and simulations. Um, and also you showed the very big complexity and uh, of this phenomena, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the time, 
the importance of the time history in all the processes that you have observed. So I was wondering if there is, uh, first of all, how do you see, uh, let's say, uh, do you see ways to actually um, bring to a further to a to a higher level this interaction between experiments and simulation? So what I'm trying to say, how do you see in the future experiments improving your numerical simulations uh, and the very essence of your uh, models? And also, if you see a place for uh, reduce order modeling in order to accelerate certain uh, understanding or comprehension of, of this phenomenon? So um, for the first uh, point, what I'm willing and what I'm trying to do more and more often is to use the numerical results to synthesize the what would be the experimental signal that corresponds to this. So for example, the, the I didn't mention it, but the results from the light scattering measurements, I was comparing the light scattering measurements or thing to experiments. And then I, I use my numerical simulation to reconstruct what will be the light scattering measurements from the numerical fields. So the, the interaction at this, at this stage, what I'm trying to do is really, uh, instead of comparing physical quantities, because when you do experiments, then you discover that actually you are got just got signal that are not the physical quantities. So I've, more and more often, I find that the comparison of physical quantities is not so uh, correct uh, or meaningful. I try more to synthesize the numerical signal from my numerical simulations and compare experimental signal with numerical signals. But for this, you, you really have to work uh, with the experimentalist all the time that explain you exactly what the signal is. So in this sense, what, what I'm trying to do is this, and then I try also to do in situ and ex situ measurements to then and try to verify that the signals that I have has a physical meaning and that everything is, is closed. For the reduce of order models, I'm definitely, um, so to be honest, I'm just not patient. So I don't run expensive and uh, super detailed large at simulations because I'm not patient. I, I just want to have the results. So uh, I use them to be sure that I have, uh, so I need detailed models to be sure that I got the physics. And then uh, I will, and I always try to simplify as much as possible the, the models are using reduce all the models um, uh, to, to got uh, then the results in, in, in real applications so that I can uh, do more, more simulation and understand the trends at, at this order. Um, what I don't like is once the reduce order model lose all physical sense. Okay, so uh, this is my way to work. It doesn't mean that uh, is the truth, but I don't like a model where oh, is fitting the results, but I don't know why and what the physics is beyond this. So I yeah. uh, I will do a, more a human learning <laughs> than a machine learning. So basically, well, uh, I think that there is a lot of, of uh, so in my job, I don't want to have a predictive model. I want to have a physical model. So I, I, I love to look at the physics. What I want to do is getting the physics, understand what's going on, not reproduce correctly the, the data. Doesn't mean that there is not interest and importance for this. But from my point of view, I want to know the physics so that I can play with the physics and control the physics to get at the end what I want. Uh, and but once again, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I like I like the human learning a lot. I, I, Thank you. I, I do the human learning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess we have another question from uh, the audience from Taimur bin Zain. So if you can unmute. Um, Yourself, uh, um, uh, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me, voice? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, you described with the uh, slide number fourteen. After that, you described with slide thirty-three and thirty-two slides. In thirty-four, you asked a twenty-fourteen uh, paper. There is a, a big error in your uh, paper, right? They, they described that. Uh, uh, we need to reduce your error. In thirty-three and thirty-four slide, then you combine all the data like uh, experimental data and LES data. 
then yeah. how you can uh, in future you can describe that uh, the, the data will be combined and uh, you can reduce the error further so you what know, is experience that there's a big basically Hello. there's a big gap between your LES and uh, and uh, if you open the slide number 34 yeah, yeah. Three, i see what you mean so what is is um, true in this in this technique? What is nice in this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Nice this in this technique is that yeah, yeah. as soon as you increase your time averaging, okay, your envelopes is gonna to decrease, and at the end you end up with the time averaging the the, the classical approach. Okay, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be sure how accurate is your model, if you are in this case you are not happy but you can reduce the time averaging okay so you run one month more and you will got 200 milliseconds of simulation and you will have the envelope that is going to be increased but reduced in that case if you really ice it's outside it means that it was not correct okay, okay. so this this technique allows us to adapt your um Experimental. Uh, sorry, if I, uh, for, sorry, if I interference in your questions. My question is: uh, What, how many errors you have reduced in this time period? Right. What you, uh, uh, in the future? How many errors you will reduce? Because there is a big gap between experimental data uh, and alien. Data. Okay. So what you want to know is how can I I correct my results? So okay, how, okay. what is the problem here? Ah, oh, okay. So what is the problem here? Uh, I really would love to know be honest with you uh if, if if so i what i what i think a lot about is um the intermittency once again so let me explain what i mean is that when you look at the results in this configuration and this is one of the most difficult configuration because it's super intermittent here suit is occurring really for specific conditions if you look for example your uh, pdf or temperature only 10% of the most rare events of temperature is the one that NPH is, is the one that provides you suit. Okay. So it means that, for example, it's true that all different simulation you have in literature provides you a good description of the temperature when you look at time average temperature. But what is doing suit is not the time average values, it's the stream values, the rare events. And when you look at the PDF, for example, the temperature values between okay. the different simulations, these are completely different. Okay. So um, in a perfect world where we I can assess all the different uh, distribution of temperature for all the points from the experimental point of view and pHs at the same time and suit volume fraction, and at the same time doing the same exercise from the numerical point of view. Uh, I think that we can improve a lot our understanding. The problem here is that as soon as you have configuration where suit is so uh, rare, you have to be sure that you got the rare events. And I'm not sure in this simulation if my problem here is that I don't get the correct gaseous rare events to have the correct suit events, okay? But to know it, you have to have the experiments and for some of them, you have them, okay? So this is one nice configuration because the PDF, but still the PDF, the, the discretization sometimes is hiding what are the rare events, okay? It's two events over 2000. So that's that's the point here. And this configuration is really not the good one, I think, and that's, that's the conclusion. If you want to, okay. that's the final, this is the most challenging configuration for that you can imagine. Basically, you, you need, you're basically you're asking that we need to improve further parameters. We need to detect further parameters that are affecting in our error, right? You need to improve the description okay, okay. of the statistics, not time averaging, fluctuation, but even not, this is even not uh, sufficient. You need to have the correct uh, description of all the events, the rare events. And this is super difficult for LES because this is now hidden by the subgrade models of the gas phase for field. Okay, this is one of the of the uh, crucial part here is that even the all the small scale are playing a role, and it's something that LES as super is super difficult. Okay? LES is super nice for large scale process, but all the small scale processes are modeled, and for suit, 
is doing a lot. Okay, so that's why we really have to think. But now you have some configuration that are turbulent, such as the turbulent jet flames, okay. where things are easier because it's less intermittent. Okay, and you can have turbulent flames. It's, it's really a matter of intermittency here. Uh, more intermittent is the soot fields, more is a rare event, more you have to correctly got these more uh, low uh, rare events. And these rare events are mainly due to by the small scales. Okay. That means that it's cover scale that is doing everything. So it's super tough. Okay. okay but if you're lucky, you have some situation is more the large scale. In that case, it's going to work. Thank you, Mark. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. We have, I guess, the last question from the audience. Uh, I'll give the yeah, virtual microphone to King, King Kong Lee. Yeah. Please, if you can. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benetta, for your very interesting presentation and a lot of information, a lot of new information for me too. Um, I would like to ask you on slide 23 when you present about the size distribution. So did you use light scattering measurements for determine that value? For the, um, the size distribution. Uh, no, 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 no. This is uh, so light scattering. Um, okay, no. So this is the results from LES. Okay, this is numerical results. Okay. Okay, for simulation from simulation. Simulation. This is simulation, and okay. you can have experimental results in turbulent flame. Most of the time, you're gonna to have uh, these kinds of information is coming from the SMPS systems. Okay, it's kind yeah, of yeah, time yeah. measure. But the difficulties of this system, not the difficulty, but the key, the one of the, uh, I would say, disadvantage of this technique is that they are doing a time averaging, okay? They cannot work at 10 kilohertz. So they are already collecting information over seconds. So you cannot look really at the dynamics of the PSD with these approaches. Yes. So in that case, uh, to my knowledge, huh? you may try to do something with the LEI, but LEI, uh, to got instantaneous information on the particle size distribution, you can hope to do something with LEI. Um, ah, you have also something that has been done, uh, can be done on light, with light scattering, but still will not be uh, on the particle size distribution. But, and for example, the team of Jerome Young did some uh, evolution with time of the mean diameter. Okay. Yeah, we use the DMS or dynamic mobility spectrometer to measure that. And we see it also show two peak when we go to high above the burner, higher uh, height. Uh, but it shows the mobility diameter. Yeah. So it is the similar between mobility diameter and aggregate diameter. Or... So the one, this is one of the, the critical points. I agree with you. Um, is, is the diameter, diame uh, so mobility diameter is not uh, the primary particle diameter, is not the aggregate diameter, is not something that you transport in numerical simulations. Um, however, on the one side, you can rely on some of, uh, I would say semi-empirical models that exist. There are also some theoretical models that provide you some way to uh, translate the diame mobility diameter in primary particle or aggregate diameter. And what has been observed, at least for metal oxides, is that there is kind of, I would say, zero order uh, correspondence between the aggregate diameter and the mobility diameter, okay? But this is definitely not the same things, I agree with you. But as a starting point, you can say, okay, I will try to simulate this. As, and, and try to do the link, okay? For soot, it's not so true. You cannot say this, but for met metal oxide, what I've seen is that it's something that is classically done. You can, they they do this by by SMPS, so diameter, mobility diameter, and then they collect them with them and they calculate then the aggregate diameter and the primary particle diameter from TEM images. Mm -hmm. And then they try to, to see that, well, at the end it's not so, so a huge error when you try to yeah. do this. But I mean, you have to be careful. In any case, you, you definitely don't have to compare it in this way. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, I would like to ask you the meaning of two big shape here. This means that the mesh between two different kinds of suit aggregate 
Oh. So in this specific two peak shape, yeah, it means that there is a so soot uh, production, soot nucleation is really a long process. Okay. So it okay. is so basically your pHs are not consumed directly, like just like this. So this is the big difference compared to metal oxides. And we said that as soon as you have a precursor, their conversion to TO2 is quite uh, fast, whereas soot is really a long process, okay? So you can find nucleation almost everywhere. For example, if you look at this video here, but just the image, this is the, prim this is the section, the class of particles that are just uh, of one nanometer. So they are just uh, generated. And you can see here that they are everywhere. It means the nucleation yeah. is localized almost everywhere, okay? Yeah. Because precursors are there and they are not consumed in totality by the, the process of soot because it's, it's too long. Yeah. So when you have a two-peak shape, it means that you have probably still nucleation that is going on mm -hmm. and then bigger and bigger particles that arrive. Yeah, so I think this uh, can we can understand in the case of turbulent flame because yeah. everything is missed, but we work with the pre-missed laminar flame and we still see that. Yeah. It's quite strange. <laughs> so it's quite strange, but still, if you do, for example, a comparison with the numerical result, they are telling you that the pH is concentration is still there. In okay. the laminar pre-missed flame? In the laminar pre flame. Okay. So yeah. basically, you, you, you never go to a, a pH concentration that is zero. Mm. Because the characteristic in time scale is so to, they, they are their conversion is really long. Okay. Yeah. So that at the end, maybe very, very far. But in premix flame, for example, in the case that I show, you also have um a cold flow uh, wall. And since the temperature is, is lower there, and this also affects the production of everything. So you don't have to look at the results closer to the to the wall. But if I don't know if they have done very, very long laminar premix flames to start to see if one day you will end up with all the precursors that are left, okay? And for soot, um, to explain this, they also think, and there are models that tells us that maybe the nucleation is a um, convertible process. So time times you can go back. Mm -hmm. That's can explain. But still, uh, once you have, nucleation is the, 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 the most difficult part to, to understand and to model and to, to, to characterize. So you have some evidence and you have different models that can explain the evidence, but there is no clear proof, okay? So you try different uh, explanation and different models and if they fit, you may think, okay, this is cool. So this is how it works. But since you have many processes at the same time, so you never know what is the, the competition, okay? Yeah. And... And last point is that when you use, for example, the SMPS, sometimes you can got all the time the, the first peak, but it also depends on the way you interpret your experimental results and how the SMPS is doing is post-processing. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's not certain, okay? This is the way generally the community speaks about this, that there are pretty question marks everywhere. Thank you for showing your beautiful research. <laughs> and thank you, the organizer, too. Uh, thanks. <laughs> okay, I guess, yeah, we can uh, yeah, close the Q&A session. And thank again, uh, the speaker, uh, Benedetta, for a nice talk. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, everyone. Enjoy enjoy the rest of our day and your weekend. And uh, thank again. Thank for you. Let's thank again, the speaker. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.